Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber. And today our special guest is Thomas DeLauer, and he'll be speaking at our conference in February. Thomas is one of our triple threat presenters, having a passion for fitness, nutrition, and science. So how's it going today, Thomas? It's it's going great, man. I definitely have no complaints. Well, thanks for being here. I know we've been struggling to find time between your busy schedule and your little kids running around and taking care of them. No, it's it's awesome, man. I'm I'm glad we could carve it out, and I'm glad that we uh, <laughs> glad we can make it happen. Well, we were talking uh, before this started about finding some balance in life, and maybe we'll touch on that as well. So, Definitely. Yeah, a little more about Thomas. Thomas is a new nutritionist and, and an expert in diet, cognitive nutrition, and also performance. Thomas brings a wealth of knowledge to the table along with a remarkable research team that backs everything he produces with science and evidence. Thomas is a successful athlete and businessman who was tipping the scale at 300 pounds earlier in life. It was through his 100 pound weight loss transformation that he was able to tap into how he could help others. Tom is also a speaker and has a huge following on YouTube and social media where he delivers production quality and easy to understand segments on many interesting topics. So Thomas, if you can pro provide us with some more background and tell us about your personal and professional interests. Yeah, um, a little bit more on my my background. I was an executive recruiter in the beginning of my career, you know, commission only job where I was, uh, you know, in the healthcare industry. So predominantly working long-term acute care uh, hospital settings. So kind of learned the administ administrative side of, of the healthcare system at a pretty young age uh, and then switched over into phys physician recruiting. And that's kind of where some of my passion ended up lying. I really enjoyed uh, talking to doctors. I really enjoyed giving them good opportunities and helping them move up the ladder. And, you know, a lot of my specialty was moving with uh, physician administrators. So moving people out of, uh, you know, physician roles into administrative roles, uh, you know, hospital, long-term acute care, and also just uh, standard acute care CEOs that were physicians because I could kind of bridge that gap. So early in my career, I really understood kind of what was wrong with some of our medical system. And I don't mean that in a cheeky kind of way. I mean, like what, what's like, what, what's going on here? Like I see these, like not necessarily flaws, but I understood how the system worked and where patients might not be getting exactly what they need. And this ironically is at a point when I'm on the verge of becoming diabetic, I'm pre-diabetic, I'm 300 pounds. And uh, I get recruited into another role running an ancillary lab services company. And my job becomes really understanding the fee for service model and that side of the medical system and understanding uh, we were predominantly working with like salivary cortisol testing and ZRT labs and some of that stuff. So what I really learned through that was, well, I get to speak with physicians and help them understand some of these other sides of biochemistry that they may not understand as far as like a lab testing side of things goes. So that's where my background came from. It was all sort of self-learn through my career. My education was in psychology. Uh, so then I went through my own transformation and took a sabbatical after my company uh, liquidated, took a little break. And then I shared some of my story on social media. I'm really abbreviating. And it was kind of at the right time when social media was really at this inflection point. So I shared my story and it kind of blew up, realized that what I was good at was articulating subject matter in a way that would get people excited. And I kind of stuck with that. And then on the personal side, I've been with my wife since high school. So I've never been with another woman. So I don't know what it's like other than my wife and uh, have two wonderful kids, a five-year-old and a two-year-old. We have three dogs, two horses. Uh, we've got a, a busy little life. Yeah. Well, well, great, Thomas. Well, you were, you had mentioned the, the balance of uh, work, family, and play. And how do you manage that? I don't. Um, <laughs> I, I could say I could say that I manage it, but in reality, every day sometimes is a little bit of a curveball, you know, because you can have a plan as much as you want to have a plan, but kids have a unique way of throwing a wrench in just about every plan that you have. So although I am very committed to my plan and I write out my plan for the day, the day prior, uh, just things happen. Like something came up today prior to our podcast. We had to push it back because the kids were like, there's this an issue we needed to deal with. Uh, so the thing that I really focus on is that, like we talked about, you don't need to have this boundary that's always set between here's my work life and here's my home life. I suppose it depends on your career, but doing what I do, I really enjoy what I do. 
there really are no thick, bold lines between what I do for fun, what I do for hobby and what I do for work. I mean, or even family, it's, it's all encompassing. And I feel like that, in my opinion, is sort of the trick to having long-term success and sustainability because I, I don't feel like I'm living a double life. And a lot of what we've kind of taken on as society is living a double life. You have your work life and you have your home life. And I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's really good for the long term. So managing it is one thing. Strategy is another, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I like um, uh, to say that uh, you enjoy everything that you do. So at the end of the day, that's that's the important uh, part, especially as a business owner, because there really is a blur. There's no separation between all of them. So enjoying life, you know, my kids are are, are growing and out of the house now, but uh, I certainly feel for you, and it's it's a joy and pre uh, pleasure to run uh, to raise a family. So uh, yeah, so uh, maybe we can dive right into the topic. I, I think it's fantastic having uh, some somebody like you around on social media that basically uh, explains the science very simply. And, you know, when I introduced you, I, 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 I am just blown away by the, the, the production quality of your, uh, your, uh, your bits on social media. And you, you, again, you, you bring up evidence and I think you're really spot on. And so the, the question is, how, how is it that uh, we should come to trust someone like you that has no professional credentials, but yet uh, looks at the science and takes a deeper dive? Yeah. I, I, the first thing I always say, if someone doesn't want to trust me because I don't have a medical credential, that, that's on them. I can't force them to trust me. I mean, I'm not going to, and I'm not going to try to, but I do feel that my personal and professional experience speaks for itself. But what I'm good at is getting people passionate about it. Because if you're talking about something that you're passionate about, then you share that with people and they share that passion with you. And that's what's motivating for people is that they really need to be inspired to learn something, inspired for that education. And I do the work, you know, and at the end of the day, being able to articulate things in a way that people can resonate with in a real life fashion I think is nine tenths of the equation. And that's where a lot of physicians admittedly aren't really great at what they do. They say, you know, like they have this textbook mindset and it's really hard for them to communicate lifestyle to patients a lot of times. And they're open about that. It's not something that they're trying to like hide. You need people that translate. And as long as I'm open about being sort of a translator of biochemistry to help the lay person, if you want to call it that, understand, uh, then I think that's great. So, you know, my audience, people that want to listen to me are people that want to hear it from a regular person that's been there but has, a, has an ability to sort of translate it. Sure. Well, I, I think um, looking at the literature and, and taking a deeper dive is, is open to anybody that, that uh, wants to, to learn more and, and uh, expand their horizons and, and help others. And, and that's precisely why we've invited you to the conference. So again, at the conference, we have the general public and we have healthcare professionals. And uh, the idea is that you're going to be giving a pre presentation that will be approved for educational credits for healthcare professionals. And uh, again, it's it's a great honor. And and uh, we need uh, more people like you that are very dynamic and make the presentation uh, fun because some of this stuff can be really boring. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and uh, another another interesting aspect, my wife sent me an article about uh, teasing out cranks and quacks. So <laughs> re researchers and doctors. And so, you know, there's really a fine line because, um, you know, you can hang your hat on, on a particular uh, uh, hypothesis. And, and the thing is that uh, it's interesting, but you need the evidence in humans. Yeah to show that there's a benefit. Now there's all kinds of evidence, there's mechanistic as evidence, there's animal evidence. And so the idea is to um, present the information with as much evidence as you, as you have. Do you agree with that? Absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, where I think it's, that's where I think it's difficult because anyone on social media, it's a blessing and a curse because anyone can pull up a PubMed pub study and look at something, uh, some you know obscure rodent model, um, study and, and draw whatever conclusion they want to draw and expose it as fact. 
But I think that you earn a lot more credibility if you explain, hey, this is exciting. Look at what we're potentially discovering. Get people excited about the prospect of what could be, but be honest about it. You don't need to like take that and take it to the bank and then reinforce with whatever larger scale observational human data we have. And the bottom line is that you can almost always find some study to support your argument if you really look hard enough, whether it's mechanistic or rodent. And I don't really have a problem with rodent model studies because I feel like, okay, hey, this is something that just excites people to learn, but I would never explain it as something that we take to the bank, uh, you know, all the way. Sure. Well, a, a great example is, um, you know, cancer is, is really a, a hard endpoint to kind of talk about, well, nutrition and cancer, for instance. And um, I, I've had conversations with Adrian Schneck from uh, the Barrow Institute in um in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. I don't know if you're familiar with her. And a few years back, she really said to me, Jeff, you know, it's interesting because we have a lot of, you know, animal models and mechanistic research looking at the diets and cancer. And, and, you know, back then she said, you know, I don't think that I can recommend that you discuss these types of diets with patients at this point, because we don't have enough evidence in humans. And I think you can present the information, as you said, but you, you have to be honest about it and say, you know, th this is, this is, we this is not the answer. You can perhaps uh, approach a particular medical problem with nutrition, but time will tell as to um, whether it uh, truly has an effect or not. Yeah. And, and, you know, to counter that it's, it's, if you only look at human observation or, or large scale epidemiological stuff, you're sort of living five steps in the past a little bit all the time. So if you only hang your hat on that and you don't give a glimmer of hope to what's promising, again, with that thoughtful nod that, okay, this research that's coming out in rodents or this mechanistic stuff, okay, take it with what it is, but also give a thoughtful nod to the fact that this is progressing and this is maybe where we should start looking a little bit. And if someone is their own N of one, and they're taking it upon themselves to change their life and alter their nutrition, then that's the kind of thing they do want to look at because it's not hard to say, Hey, I'm going to test this out on myself and Hey, I'm going to eat beef liver. Or, you know what? It's not like anything dangerous or scary. It's just, Hey, make these subtle tweaks. And at the very least, at the very least, maybe you'll get a placebo effect and it helps you improve your lifestyle either way. Yeah. Well, I kind of had the same conversation with Lane Norton, who's also going to be speaking at our conference. And, um, uh, the, and and the, the the comment we brought up is you know what do you do in the real world so you know we're we're in the trenches trying to give people uh, good advice and so you, you like you said you can't just wait for the the ev the uh, you know the absolute evidence to to arise so you have to take the information at hand and um, and go with it and uh, I think uh, you know one of the points that Lane makes and I actually listened to your uh, talk with him 10 months ago, you were, you know, you were on social media mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we're kind of discussing very similar things. And that is that you have to look at both sides of it. And I think Lane calls out people when they, they really go f too far with um, um, trying to, to make a point that this, this, this is, this is the solution when there's so many other directions you can go. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And Lane's one of those guys that, you know, he, he, he is an agitator online and that's kind of how he's presented himself. And I don't think he would fault me for even saying that. Um, that's, that's kind of what, what he does, but he's come around a lot in even his approach with things. And what's interesting is seeing his approach change a little bit. I shouldn't say change his, his delivery has changed significantly and it's warranted him the ability to talk with people that are on the other side of the table. Like even he was just with Andrew Huberman, right? Someone that he had completely combated against before. I think when you approach things, in a polite fashion, you can find out that, you know, what we disagree on is much less than what the general public might think we disagree on. You know, Lane and I, me being a low carb guy, him predominantly not being a low carb guy, you would think that we're polar opposites, right? It's like, when we actually look at the common denominators, we have a lot in common. We train the same way outside of our thought process on carbs versus not carbs. We really share a lot of the same thing. And I think that's the kind of look that people need to have. They need to stop and say, okay, these things that we disagree on are not necessarily fundamental, monumental things we disagree on. They are nuanced discussions, but sometimes in the eye of the viewer, they seem monumental. Like it's part of social media has put us in different camps. Like I feel as a low carb guy that I'm on a different planet than the high carb group. 
But over the years, I've come to realize that, well, we both agree on a deficit. We both agree on some certain things as far as benefits go. I don't necessarily subscribe 100% to a, a clear cut calories in calories out model. I think we're a complex, um, you know, thermodynamic <laughs> equation there and an open thermodynamic system that has a lot at play. But at the end of the day, I still don't deny that that exists. And I guess my point is, is that this whole world of social media, like, unless you're going to an extreme and saying, Hey, there's a rodent model study that says, if you eat celery, it's going to cure cancer. So everyone needs to eat six socks of celery a day. You know, then most of us are on the same page. Yeah, so we we all agree with that, and we all agree that uh, social media wouldn't be fun in, in, in unless there were two camps. <laughs> totally, totally right. And, and you know, actually, scientific research is kind of what, that way. There's always two camps battling against each other. So social media perhaps mirrors it. But the idea is that we have to come together. And 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 Lane actually agrees with you and myself that there there are more common themes. And you know, as you know, and for our audience, we actually all got together. Uh, you, me, Lane, Brett Shear, and uh, Paul Mason, and we're going to devote Friday morning to uh, the, the topic of the conference, where is nutrition headed? And we're going to have a nice panel discussion at the end and kind of tease out these things and and um, hopefully find some common themes and of which there are probably many. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, Thomas, uh, your topic is really going to get into nutrition and fitness. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe briefly talk about um, uh, what directions uh, we should be going in terms of uh, uh, the proper nutrition and and uh, different types of athletes, the the elite athlete versus the beginner? Yeah, no, great. This is uh, you know where I where I live and play most of the time. You know, with my own experimentation, but also just what what I talk about, um, ranging from the person that uh, first steps foot in a gym and is now considering themselves somewhat of an athlete because they're on their way there or someone that is in the, you know, the upper, upper echelons of fitness. And I work a lot with uh, special operations within the army and other special, uh, special forces groups. And that's like exactly the kind of thing, right? The very, very top percent of people that are really just looking for maximum optimization. So with that, I mean, what I want to be focusing on with my talk, um, I want to kind of look at two sides of it. I want to look at the baseline sort of insulin resistance piece, like what people need to do to just get them optimized in the most rudimentary fashion and stave off sort of that metabolic dysfunction that is really proving to be the biggest cause of so many different issues that we, as we get older, right? That mitochondrial dysfunction at the root of so many things. So I want to kind of compare how fitness ties in with that. A lot of really interesting research coming out surrounding the world of just being sedentary versus exercise, right? So, uh, you know, referencing one study just briefly, uh, you might've seen it, it was talking about how essentially being sedentary can erase the benefits of exercise, right? So I want to talk about microdosing exercise. I feel like that's a very important thing that people could really adopt into their lifestyle. What I mean by that is rather than breaking up your day and having 60 minutes in the gym, I want to recommend that people stop throughout the day and do 50 air squats or something every hour, instead of trying to find time to go to the gym and beat yourself up and debilitate yourself. The evidence is truly starting to suggest that if you do a 60 minute hard workout and then you go sit on your butt for 12 hours there, the metabolic outcome is about the same and the risk of mortality ends up being about the same. So I think back of my life when I was in the corporate healthcare world and I would just go and I'd kick my butt for 60 minutes and then I'd go and I'd sit on my butt drinking monster energy drinks for 13 hours, like basically erasing everything. Now with that, it's a nice dovetail into just talking about like insulin independent glucose uptake and how this is such a big piece and how movement and combining that with a lower carbohydrate lifestyle can be so powerful when it comes down to just, I don't want to say reset because it's kind of a cheeky way of saying things, but sort of reset and kind of reverse that clock a little bit as far as the mitochondrial age is concerned. Uh, so that's a big, big piece for me. And then on the elite side, it's more about, okay, how can there be a low carb high-end elite athlete? And if you look around on social media, you're going to come to the conclusion that that probably doesn't exist because that's what's out there, but it's not true. I mean, as someone myself that trains a lot as a low carb athlete, I can certainly tell you that there is a way and it all comes down to timing. It all comes down to manipulation it all comes down to small amounts of carb timing, how you allocate your carbohydrates. So that's a big piece that I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about targeted ketogenic diet, 
different times of day that you can implement carbohydrates if you are a very active athlete. Um, some will disagree, but with the exception of an endurance athlete, I think that there is some benefit to like an anaerobic athlete having some carb uptake, like upwards of, you know, or probably in between the ballpark of like 40 to 70 grams of carbohydrates surrounding the workout. I think that you have minimal impact on ketone formation at that point. And you also can allow for proper, you know, glute four translocation and allow for that glucose tolerance to remain intact. So I think that's really important for someone that's shifting back and forth between aerobic and anaerobic with their type of activity. And that's just it in a quick nutshell. I mean, I'm happy to dive into detail with anything that sounded interesting though. Yeah. Well, Thomas, you just said a mouthful and I asked a <laughs> lot of questions, but uh, let's, let's back up, kind of tease through it a little bit um, and talk about the, um, you know, metabolic uh, syndrome in in, in uh, people that just want to go to the gym. And you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the insulin de independent transport, the um, the GLUT4, the glucose transport mm -hmm. uh, receptors that uh, work independent of uh, insulin. And um, I guess you were alluding to the fact that uh, maintaining healthy uh, skeletal muscle uh, um, increases that 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 pathway and uh, helps muscle to metabolize energy and, and glucose. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, in a, in a very colloquial way, that's, you know, you're, you're increasing the, the glucose sink, so to speak. I mean, the more, not necessarily even muscle mass that you have, but the more mitochondrial density that you have uh, is going to help that. So people think, oh, I need to become a bodybuilder if I wanna have, you know, good glucose disposal. No, not the case. You need to have, well, yes, that certainly does help, but you also need to have more mitochondrial density and more, you know, capillarization. And, and, and that's all going to help as far as a glucose sink. And when I say glucose sink, I just mean a place for glucose to go. You know, if someone is metabolically deranged, that's the issue is there's nowhere for the glucose to go. No one is sitting here saying carbs are the devil. They're not saying they're the enemy, but when you're looking at people that are in this serious, what I call quote unquote, a metabolic level three trauma center. Like they're just metabolically so bad off. Like I will go on record at least for myself and say that I, I think that refined carbohydrates and a bunch of carbohydrates are not a good solution for those kinds of people. But I mean, again, holes can be poked in that absolutely one way or the other, but with exercise, it allows you to create a little bit more slack for you to absorb those carbohydrates. Um, and when you're looking at like a lower carb person, there's this thought process that they cannot do their exercise without having some carbohydrates in the equation. You and I both know that to not be the case. Obviously with low carb, you can exercise just fine. Maybe you'll see a decline initially in performance, but it's not enough that the recreational or beginner athlete or resistance trainer would ever notice. But with that, you know, you can allow someone to say, Hey, if you want to have your carbohydrates, or you're going to have 40 or 50 grams of carbohydrates on your ketogenic diet, maybe try allocating them pre or intra or post-workout. Just try it. It's going to allow you to get away with a little bit more. You're going to mentally satisfy that need that you feel you have to have carbohydrates. You might actually see an increase in your performance. Who knows? Everyone's a little bit different, but at the very least, it gives you a quote unquote safer time to have those carbohydrates without the spillover. Um, also there's some, some well, anecdotal experience, but there's also some preliminary evidence that suggests that by sort of conditioning the cells to be able to utilize glucose at a faster rate during exercise, you're sort of improving that glucose uptake, that transport system. So it's kind of like, uh, instead of a two lane road with a few cars going by every now and then you're having an eight lane freeway. That's having lots of cars going by and you're having more opportunities to facilitate glucose uptake which gives you a better chance at adaptation. The same thing applies for the fat adapted individual. It's the same discussion on the other side of the equation. So if someone is say running at a low intensity and they're doing a ketogenic diet, well, I would argue that they're going to get fat adapted faster because they're pounding fats into the system and they have to upregulate PPA or alpha and they have to, this upregulation and carnitine palmitoyl transferase for beta oxidation, all this stuff is gonna upregulate faster because there's an increased demand because you're moving faster. So I think no matter which way you're going with it's to improve glucose uptake as a metabolically deranged individual or to improve beta oxidation or fat adaptation in the ketogenic athlete, I think timing exercise and carbohydrates properly is really part of the equation. 
Great. Well, what about the insulin sensitive individuals? So, you know, we actually uh, measure for that in our office that we can, uh, you know, we look at what we call the insulin spectrum and we determine um, if somebody's insulin resistant close to diabetes or actually insulin sensitive and metabolically flexible. And some have made the argument that uh, it, it, the insulin sensitive people, unfortunately, um, represent a smaller majority of the population, as you mentioned, but um, in a sense, they they seem to do well on carbohydrate. Now, maybe early on, I you know we we have to wait and see what happens to these people later in life. But but can an athlete be successful uh, on carbohydrates predominantly? I, absolutely. I mean, look at the uh, you know a lot of the competitive athletes. I mean, are high carbohydrate diets. The issue we run into and. I'm, slight digression here, but because just because that is what most of them are doing doesn't mean that that's the best way. Uh, and I've, you know, gone on record saying that before I'm like, eh, well, okay. Just because there's an adaptation period that scares athletes away sometimes with doing a lower carb diet, they stay away from it because I understand they, they can't afford to take that little blip on the radar of a decline in performance while they adapt. Um, so it's what they've been doing for the last 50, 60 years. So sure, we'll just keep the high carbohydrates going. And as long as you're active, you're probably going to be insulin sensitive. But that doesn't mean that you can cannot perform well in the other side of the equation. So for an insulin, in, uh, insulin sensitive individual, absolutely, they're going to thrive in a carbohydrate rich environment. And your body really does work in a sort of use it or lose it fashion. Like you're going to have better uptake of whatever your body is predominantly used to seeing. It's just like someone that's doing a keto diet. If they've been keto for three, four, five years, their level of fat adaptation and transport is going to be through the roof to the point where a lot of times when they have glucose, it shocks them out of the system, right? It's like, what the heck's going on? Their glucose goes sky high because they have that peripheral insulin resistance because the body's like, hey, wait a minute, what the heck is this stuff? I don't need all of this. I've been you know, reallocating it to the brain for all this time. So it scares people. And that's where sometimes this blood sugar data that we get can really be detrimental because it can like, for someone that's low carb, you'll see a big spike when you have carbohydrates. It doesn't mean that the carbohydrates are bad. It means that your cells are doing what they're supposed to do. They've become accustomed to fats. So in a lot of ways, you become more insulin resistant when you are doing a lower carb diet, especially if you're inactive, but you're not pathologically insulin resistant. It's just sort of a uh, happen in the periphery. It's just at like an exercise level and a muscle level. And I guess what I'm ultimately trying to say is that you can train yourself to be better one way or the other. And where I'm not well versed in the research, but I know there is some research is, are we epigenetically predisposed to be better at certain fuels, right? Um, again, my explanation, I ran my first marathon when I was 11 years old. I tend to think that my history as a long distance runner, as a kid, my guess is that perhaps on an epigenetic level, I had a level of fat adaptation that occurred at a very like young, very important age. And there's no data that I could say to back that up other than very like simple, you know, like epigenetic research, right? But it makes sense that I adapted at a young age to be very, very good at using fats, which made me thrive on a ketogenic diet, probably more so than even other people. Uh, but if you never give yourself the opportunity to do that, then you'll never know. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, physiologic insulin resistance, these people that are, um, you know, uh, on a low carb diet, and that's the term that, that, that we use. And I, I just bring up the point to say that, again, it's not everybody that goes to the gym that has to go on a low carb or ketogenic diet, but uh, you and I can relate to this, although you, you, you were very good at uh, managing fat early on, but we, we have young athletes that that do their sport, go to the gym and exercise and they feel invincible and they, they eat whatever they want. And, you know, we eventually see them in the office and, and they're gaining weight and, you know, they're still in fairly good shape and lo and behold, they're insulin resistant. Yeah. And so, you know, as, as you know, you have to consider the athlete, the, the age, the sex, where they are in their life in terms of what would be the proper diet. But again, we just see so much insulin resistance in the world that, um, you know, even the athlete has to be uh, sensitive to that. Yes. I mean, and I think what you're alluding to is you can't, you can't out train a bad diet. I really don't think you can, you know, I sure there are loads of benefits that come with exercise. I am the biggest proponent of exercise. You could probably meet 
but I will still go on record to say that I, it's very easy to out eat your exercise. And we see it with the, like the football coaches, right? You see, like I, I use that kind of analogy where it's like these guys that played football, high school, college, even professional. And there's a lot of them that are seriously metabolically dysfunctional. Like now when they're in their fifties, sixties, and they were athletes and maybe they're not as active now, but it didn't protect them into the future. You know, maybe it helps them a little bit, but if you're eating 500 grams of carbohydrates per day, and then all of a sudden you're no longer as active and you continue to eat like that, that's a serious problem. So I guess the, the curse of it is that if you're willing to eat 500 grams of carbohydrates today uh, per day as an athlete, you probably need to continue to train like that for the rest of your life. And I don't think that that's really possible as we age. I just, I mean, you just can't train like you're in your twenties forever. I know some people would disagree, but there's a lot of changes that occur all the way down to sodium potassium pumps changing and losing you know, mass that way. It's just, that's a, that's a big thing to try to bite off to say, I'm going to commit to eating this many carbs forever because I'm an athlete. Now, I think if you could adapt yourself a little bit sooner in life to be flexible, and that's what I'm all about is being metabolically flexible to use both fuels then I think you're setting yourself up for success long-term. Yeah. So you mentioned that you don't exercise. So, you, you know, you eat less and exercise more, you, you know, this balancing the, the, uh, the energy equation. I, um, what, what about, uh, you know, exercise and, and driving appetite and how, how do you balance that in someone who's trying to lose weight? That's a very good question. And something that it's funny because we've got some videos coming out on this topic, like in December, because that's a huge one. Uh, like I just, you know, I'll, I'll relate personally. If I go out and I do a moderate resistance training workout where I'm, you know, maybe 10 to 12 repetition range, adequate rest, you know, where I have enough time to, you know, I'm, I'm not getting crazy winded, right? Let's just say moderate intensity resistance training. My appetite is usually pretty curbed, Right. But if I go and I hit the Peloton bike and I kick my butt for 45 minutes or an hour, and let's just say theoretically, I burn 500, 600 calories. I can guarantee you if left to my own devices, I would probably eat double that the rest of the day, right? Because the appetite stimulating effect of exercise is tremendous, especially with cardio. Now I am the big fan of cardio as a runner, right? But I'm also, I'm in a different position being that, A, this is my career to stay in shape. So I, I keep a serious wolf at the door with that. Um, and, and I'm very careful about what I eat, but it's very easy for a beginner to start exercise and then it ramps up all these hunger signals and, you know, leptin ghrelin ratios do get thrown off, not necessarily in a bad way, they, but they do. And it can make it very easy for someone to overeat. Now, there's a very fine line, right? Because overeating is also going to be required for muscle repair to a certain degree, but it's more so about the balance of muscle protein synthesis and breakdown. But that's a nuanced discussion. And for someone that's a beginner, that's just trying to stave off insulin resistance. You know, if they start eating 500, 600, 700 more calories per day, and they're not really aware of it, just because they burned 200 calories on the elliptical that morning, that overfeeding in general is going to be terrible for insulin resistance, whether it's fats or carbohydrates. Um, so it's a tough one. It's like, how do you balance that? How do you improve that? Are there techniques that you can use? Um, I'm a big proponent of very, very high protein personally, uh, as an athlete, that's more ketogenic athlete. I am much more on a one-to-one -one ratio of fat to protein compared to a lot of the two-to-one fat to protein ratio that you see in like a, you know, more general sense or a three-to-one in the therapeutic sense. Um, which catches me some flack with the lower carb community because it's pretty high protein. But again, if you're active, you need to satiate yourself somehow, because if I'm left to my own devices, I'll end up eating, you know, way too much fat. It's just way too easy for me to do it. And it, even though we are an open thermodynamic system that is flexible and changes, and we can't always predict if you're eating 5,000 calories of fat, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. Well, we're, we're in the same camp where we think that uh, you really have to ramp up the protein and cut back on the fat long-term because, um, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, fat is caloric dense. And, and I do believe that the, the calorie factor has to be um, uh, in the equation and, mm -hmm. and uh, protein can be uh, very satiating as well. And also, you know, I, I agree for myself that uh, um, cardio um, does drive my appetite. So <laughs> over the past three years, I, I was, um, you know, 
again, locked down like everyone else was. And, and all I did was run and I got fat and I got hungry <laughs> and I, I wasn't at the gym. And, and, you know, I, this the last year, I, my resolution was to get back to the gym. And I, I actually noticed that uh, I started eating less, started eating more protein and I started to trim, trim out and build muscle. So again, um, you know, perhaps endurance doesn't give you uh, uh, um, the, the mitochondrial build that you would expect. This is really diving into it. Whereas yeah. you get, you get a mitochondrial uh, boost with um, resistance training. Yes, that's a great, great discussion that can get very nuanced because I've done a video on this where the balance is building muscle that develops this mitochondrial efficiency, but coupling that with just the right amount of cardio to improve mitochondrial density, right? So it's there's that balance there where it's aerobic conditioning is very, very good for the mitochondria, but there's a very fine line between when it's too far and when you start breaking down the sheer mass that contains that mitochondria in the first place. So it's a balance of what I have found is prioritize my resistance training, but definitely supplement enough cardiovascular to make that muscle metabolically active and trigger more angiogenesis and have more blood flow and delivery and nutrient delivery. And that's really that balance. And I do think it's very independent on the person. I think it depends on, uh, their conditioning growing up, were you an endurance athlete? Are you accustomed to it? You know, again, for me being someone that's run so much before I can run and not really break down tissue, but I'm also really good at running and staying in that zone two range. When I run, uh, it's when you start creeping into that zone three and zone four, which is very easy to do for most recreational runners. Then you start breaking down muscle a lot quicker. And I went through a quick stint of getting into CrossFit for a while because I was doing some of the nutrition work with CrossFit uh, HQ and I spoke at the CrossFit games and I'm not trying to throw CrossFit under the bus at all. I think CrossFit is fun. I think it's great. Uh, but what I was finding was that my training was starting to become gamified and I was starting to want to go fast and do more aerobic and do more conditioning and lighter weight, higher reps, constantly trying to just move fast and keep up um, which was great from an athletic standpoint, but I actually started to notice a little bit of a, a negative change in my physique. And I'm just like, this is, this is interesting. You know, it's, and I attribute it to my appetite being absolutely out of control doing that kind of training. And also my sleep going to total crap because my central nervous system was fried all the time. So there really is a balance. And then when I go out and I go for a casual jog, and then I do a casual resistance training five days, you know, five days out of like seven and two days out of seven, not saying I work out seven days in a row, but five out of seven days will be more casual, moderate, and two days will be really intense. That seems to be a nice balance where I'm not having this crazy appetite and I can control what I eat much more. Yeah. Well, um, I, I don't know if you're aware, Thomas, but uh, they've done studies on endurance athletes. And when we look at heart calcium scans and, and build up a plaque in calcium, uh, the, the elite endurance athletes tend to build up more calcium and that's not necessarily a healthy thing. So it's another signal that uh, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Yeah. Do you, do you think that that has to do with the fact that the vast majority of endurance athletes don't do any resistance training? Or do you think it's the endurance work itself? I'm inclined to think it's the prior, but who knows? Yeah. Or, uh, or it, it could be unhealthy diets. I mean, there's so True. many, there's True. so many factors to consider. That's but, yeah, you know, know. Quick, yeah. Yeah. Most of the endurance athletes I know living in that world eat like absolute dog crap. I will say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but uh, listen, st st sorry for uh, stomping on your parade for some of your topics coming up in the fall, but <laughs> no. but uh, just to let the audience know, this is the stuff that you're passionate about. So uh, just two more, two, two or three more points. So we can shift gears and maybe talk about the elite athlete. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a weekend warrior, but, um, <laughs> you know, you, you're huge. And, and so, you know, what are the demands of the, uh, you know, the elite athlete? And how do you address that with nutrition? Well, I, I mean, it's, there's a lot of moving pieces with it. Let's start with that. Um, you know, I'll give some examples when I work with the special operations, you know, with different special forces groups, they are a little bit different because they are trying to maintain a high degree of cognitive function. And then they have quick bouts where they do need to potentially go anaerobic, whether it's for a combat situation or whatever. Um, so, I mean, 
a lot of times I have them do a ketogenic diet. I mean, I know it's, it sounds kind of crazy to people that are, it's foreign to, but people that are within this community can probably see the benefit there because, uh, because I find that by allowing them to kind of increase their baseline at that rate, then when they do add carbs into the mix, then it's like this added bolus of energy that they could use in a specific time, especially if you're factoring in exogenous ketones along with carbohydrates when you're already fat adapted, I think that could be huge. So that's a very nuanced thing, but that's like ultra elite, literally life or death kind of thing. Uh, when you're looking at professional athletes, or I can even just take myself, for example, I almost invariably always train fasted. That's me, right? And I think that there is a big benefit to training fasted. And I don't mean training like at the end of an 18 hour fast. I just mean first thing in the morning before I eat. Um, and I have a lot of the athletes that I work with, you know, professional athletes do the same thing. And I find that when you do that, you're able to increase that level of fat adaptation without necessarily putting them on a ketogenic diet. If they don't want to be, they can still have a moderate amount of carbohydrates, but at the very least, let's at least take that step. And at the very least, let's at least get your body adapted to doing that. And at the very least, let's have you do some glycogen depleted workouts. Then from that point on, you kind of see, okay, well, from a beta oxidation side of things and from their stamina and their potential lactate threshold, like all that stuff is improving. But also I think there's a big piece of it that's mental. When you first start training in a fasted state, it's difficult because you're not accustomed to it, but that's all relative, right? So th then when you are fueled, then things feel different. So I always try to encourage people to think that way. So I'm always about trying to create more of a, or put this, a stimulus and try to create more pressure when you're under training because training is just that. You're supposed to be training. It's not supposed to be easy. So if being fasted is hard for you at first, I reckon that's probably because of an adaptation that's occurring. So then when you take people that are more open to a ketogenic approach or a lower carb diet, I think that the amount of carbohydrates they need to replenish from their workouts is so small compared to what we really think we need. If you have a truly fat adapted athlete, the rate of gluconeogenesis is so great they're replenishing muscle glycogen at just as fast, if not even faster than a carb fueled athlete. So the carbohydrates become a little bit more of a bonus and you start finding that, well, Hey, maybe they only really need like 25 grams of carbs post-workout or 25 grams of carbs intra-workout. And the rest of the time they can be very, very low carb, keep inflammatory responses a little bit lower. They seem, seem to find their recovery is better. And again, I'm very careful to say that like, this isn't the only way and I'm not getting on my high horse, but in the athletes that I've worked with, and I've worked with some pretty big names, this has been a very good thing. And they've seen great benefit and they've seen great injury repair and they've seen they've staved off injury and staved off sort of the athlete depression that occurs at a high level, like this existential depression that happens with a lot of these athletes, like I've already achieved X, what now? You know, a lot of them get really depressed and that's what I've noticed, like being able to keep their brain sharp and keep their motivation high is nine tenths of the law, if you ask me. Well, just just remind them that uh, pressure is a privilege. Yes, <laughs> I love that. I haven't heard that before, but that's a really good. <laughs> that's uh, Maria Navratilova from tennis. That that was her line. Oh, that's perfect. So I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna steal that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So I have to say that you know I can't think of any other way but to go fasted into the gym yeah. and. Uh, it just it just seems that it improves your focus and and your strength, um, and that the the approach for the elite athlete isn't necessarily that much different than the beginner athlete is what you were what I'm getting out of your comments. And it's really, uh, it's really not no it's it's very very similar it's just yeah. just more intense. <laughs> yeah, there you go, and uh, you know I I would always like to joke that uh, you know we go to the gym and we see you know these the these um, you know, huge men and women in the gym and, you know, they're lifting more weight, they're outperforming everybody. And I said, well, sure, because before they go to the gym, they have um, a, a big cup of coffee or a couple cups of coffee. They have a cigarette, you know, and they have sugar. Yep. And, uh, you know, they might outperform, but, uh, you know, uh, for us, we say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the long-term goal, the, the prize is longevity. And so yeah. you have to see how those types of behaviors would, would affect the, uh, any type of athlete at any level. Yeah. Well, and there's some interesting research. Uh, 
again, it's somewhat early, but I find it very interesting that training in a fasted state improves that uh, you know lactate clearance quite significantly, and that's a pretty big thing. Like I, as an athlete, like uh, how can I stave off sort of that buffering of hydrogen and that burn that I ultimately get as an athlete and improve that lactate threshold by improving lactate clearance? But I take it one step further with that when I think, well, if I'm clearing lactate, you're not just clearing lactate and excreting it. That's not really what's happening. When you're clearing lactate, that's going through the Cori cycle and ultimately being reconverted back into pyruvate and energy again. So I look at it from, wow, if I am clearing lactate faster, that means that I'm creating more pyruvate, creating more energy, ultimately creating more ATP faster than the next guy. That is really, really fascinating to me. And that that's something that you'll hold on to even if you do go and train in a fed state thereafter. So if I train myself consistently in a fasted state, improve my lactate clearance, and then when it comes time for competition, I add 25 grams of a glucose solution or 50 grams of a glucose solution in, I get the benefit of those carbohydrates in an acute fashion, but I still retain the benefits of improved lactate clearance. So I just got the best of both worlds. That is why I really encourage athletes to train like seven times out of 10, 75% of the time in a fasted state, but occasionally, occasionally train with some carbs in your system. So you still maintain some ability of glucose uptake under load, because then when it comes down to competition, if you do want to train in a fed state, you'll be able to capitalize on both ends. Well, that makes a lot of sense, Thomas. So um, no, another thing that I, I've, I, I, kind of changed my ways in the past year. And I had done a lot of research on exercise sub- supplements and I'm, I'm not talking about getting jacked on steroids, but uh, do, do you think that uh, exercise supplements play a role? And I'll, I can tell you about what I've been experimenting with. Uh, I'll tell you by and large, depending on the supplement, right? Like you know, protein powders, I put in a different category. I put those more of a a food, even though they're a supplement, like I I still consider them more of a food for all intents and purposes. Creatine, like undeniable research, right? I mean, simple, cheap creatine monohydrate. As far as an ergogenic aid is concerned, caffeine and creatine are probably the most densely researched and dare I say proven. I hate, I don't say proven often, but I think it's pretty safe to say proven as really solid ergogenic aids. Um, that's a good one. So caffeine, creatine, and now the increasing research on taurine is really interesting, uh, as a, as an antioxidant, like really, really powerful. They're finding that when they do muscle biopsies of like post resistance training or post, uh, any kind of exhaustive training, there's significantly increased levels of muscle of taurine in the muscle demonstrating that taurine is increased to the muscle level as an antioxidant. And it's one of those things that you can supplement taurine in a very cheap way, one to three grams per day. I I feel cheesy even saying this, but one to three grams per day can see like up to a 15% improvement in recovery, which is pretty significant. And so I'm, I'm pretty high on the taurine stuff right now. And I've personally noticed a pretty big difference by taking just one gram post-workout. Interesting. I have a patient that just came in this week that started touring. So I'm going to have to read a little bit more about that. And I had to shut the blinds here because the, oh, okay. the suns are uh, are light here uh, for the uh, the camera. Uh, yeah. So so what I've researched is creatine and also nitric oxide. Is mm-hmm. is that something that uh, you condone? Yes. I'm a big fan, big fan of NO2, uh, especially, you know, whether, no matter how you're getting it, right. Uh, whether you're getting it from food sources, which is pretty minimal, or you're getting it from arginine, which is hard to really synthesize properly, citrulline malate, straight up, uh, you know, um, nitric oxide products, stuff like that, as long as they don't have a bunch of just artificial garbage in them. Uh, yeah. Huge fan of that. And interesting evidence kind of in the world of, of NO2, just with various things too, just uh, again, angiogenesis. So helping kind of deliver more blood and ultimately form new vessels. Like it's very, very solid for that. Um, I just read some interesting stuff just as far as brain function with nitric oxide as well. So I think there's a lot of benefits outside of just resistance training and training in general. Yeah, I'm reading the same literature. And so in, I, what I started doing was creatine and nitric oxide precursor and my, my strength I- increased within weeks. And I've been yeah. doing it now for, for nine months and recovery is off the charts. I, I mean, walk out of the gym and I'm ready to go back. 
Yeah. So it, yeah. it's benefited me and, and there, there's literature, you know, looking at this actually in elderly populations and how it helps muscle and strength and, and brain function and blood pressure. So good. Thanks for commenting on that. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, th this is great. You have me so engaged, Thomas. Like, I think we could go on all day, but <laughs> I just have uh, uh, two more points. I had mentioned that uh, perhaps you want to touch on uh, male hormones uh, at the conference because we have ja Jamie Seaman, who's an OBGYN, and she's going to be uh, covering uh, the female hormone aspect. So I thought maybe you could bring a little bit of that into uh, your presentation. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to. It's, it's an area that I think I can speak to uh, especially from a performance side. Uh, and I think from a longevity perspective, or at least vitality, I should say, like maintaining that energetic feeling as you get older, I can't speak to, you know, lifespan or anything, but there's some interesting, you know, <laughs> there's also a lot of misnomers that I want to address with like testosterone. Like, can you build muscle without testosterone or with low testosterone? And the short answer to that is yes. There's a lot of, to certain degrees, it comes down to androgen receptor density, um, comes down to testosterone estrogen ratio. I think a lot of times men are very imbalanced in their testosterone estrogen ratio. I think they have a lot of, uh, you know, the, the wrong kind of one seven H X or one seven, uh, estradiol, excuse me. So hydroxyestradiol, which is like the bad metabolite. And there's some ways that you can combat that, uh, even with high amounts of fiber in your diet, which is interesting because there's something called the estrobolome which helps metabolize estrogen. And when you metabolize estrogen, you decrease the aromatization of testosterone. So you free up more of that testosterone. Uh, I also think the testosterone to cortisol ratio is quite important, which is something that I think all men should be looking at. Uh, it's something that, you know, like them or hate them, Paul Saladino talks about quite a bit is, you know, a lot of these indigenous tribes, like as they started to kind of understand what was making them feel certain ways, and they had access to laboratory testing and understand what the stuff is. They've even told him like, this is something that we pay attention to is our testosterone to cortisol ratio. Not that they go out and test it all the time, but essentially they look at the relationship between their stress and their sex drive and things like that. And I think that's something we need to be paying attention to as well. Uh, we all know we're stressed as a society. What can we do to mitigate that? What can we do nutritionally to mitigate that? What can we do to improve that testosterone to estrogen, testosterone to cortisol ratio? Also, um, you know, like Dom Diagostino is a huge fan. When I brought him on the channel, we were talking about DHEA. He is such a big proponent of DHEA and he got me on the DHEA train and I'll take just 10 milligrams of DHEA per day. And what that did to my testosterone level, I went from a relatively low testosterone around 400 ish, but never had an issue, was never symptomatic. But when I started taking 10 milligrams of DHEA, that went up to 650. And that's pretty impressive. That's a pretty decent bump for 10 milligrams of dehydroepiandosterone. So uh, I definitely want to talk about the benefits of DHEA. And that also applies for women too, but I won't tread on uh, on Jamie's turf there. Yeah, there you go. Well, um, uh, you know, apparently everybody's testosterone, we're seeing a drop in testosterone in the population. And so maybe we should just, you know, give everybody shots of testosterone. So, you know, what the heck is going on? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of moving pieces there. I think, you know, to coin some of, uh, I had a Dr. Ben House. Are you familiar with Dr. House? Yes. Um, he's, you know, he's a little bit of a, uh, you know, a crap disturber as well, but he's also got some interesting points. And one of the areas where he is very well-versed is the world of, uh, of testosterone. He's, he's very, very well-versed in that. And we were talking about just that and, you know, it's, it becomes sort of a canary in the coal mine, we talked about this before the podcast where okay, testosterone levels are low, but that's not the root problem. That is a symptom of a bigger problem. And we also have to remember that with testosterone, we have this very important, you know, HPTA axis that is very fragile, you know, and luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. This is this whole hypothalamic pituitary axis is so fragile and that gets impacted to the nth degree by environmental factors. Like a stress, uh, BPAs, all kinds of things, and things that we're getting in copious amounts that not only affect our estrogen levels, but are also affecting our brains and also constantly burning out our dopamine receptors. That plays a role too. Hyperpalatable foods, social media, these things do impact it. And if your brain is disrupted and that signal is disrupted and the Leydig cells aren't going to be able to do their job as well. And I mean, that's a very abbreviated way of saying it, but I 
stand firm in the fact that we're not just running into the fact that, okay, hey, everyone's testosterone is low because we're we're just weaker men. That's just the way that it's happening. No, there's a lot of other stuff going on here. And again, just like anything, sometimes it's easy to look at one loudmouth in the room and not address the big holistic equation. So it's, um, yeah, apologies for uh, prompting you to say what you just said, but you said it oh. beautifully. And it's just so frustrating that, that we see patients that come in and everybody's on testosterone and we have to have a whole discussion at, at, at about it's it's really a sign of met, metabolic disease elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, the men usually get upset when, you know, we, we, we confirm or warn them that it's going to shrink their testicles if they take mm -hmm. testosterone supplementation. And it's just a long-term commitment. And that's what I always tell people. I mean, as someone that, you know, I am you know, heavily muscled dude. I'm not as big as people think I am. I'm only 180 pounds, but obviously uh, I catch a lot of stuff. People obviously accuse me of that all the time. And, and it doesn't offend me. In fact, it's a compliment, but I explain to people that like, you know, here's why I don't honestly. Uh, and it's, you know, you know, when I say accused, I, people don't just say like, I'm just shooting up steroids in the bathroom. They just say, oh, you're on just, you've got to be on testosterone replacement. Look at the muscle that you carry. I'm like, well, actually my testosterone level is quite low, not super low, but moderately low. And I still maintain muscle, but I'm not symptomatic. So if you go to the doctor and your testosterone levels are low, that sometimes plants the seed for you to become symptomatic. <laughs> so, oh, I have low test. Oh, now that you mention it, my sex drive is crap. Now that you mention it, I do have this like doughy midsection. Well, never mind the fact that, you know, you eat 600 grams of processed carbs per day. Never mind the fact that there's all, there's all these other things we have to look at before we can just we as a society, we like to be a little bit of a victim and have something to blame. We like to have a little bit of a, um, you know, a scapegoat in a way, like let's say, ah, oh, it's the testosterone. That's the problem. Okay. Well, there's environmental factors, but there's also dietary and lifestyle factors. And I'm going to be purely hypothetical here, but the decline in testosterone in men does seem to kind of coincide with the big influx in hyperpalatable processed food, right? So I'm inclined to think there's something going on there nutritionally as well. Well, Tom, look, you know, you're setting the example as as, as so many others, uh, setting the bar very high as to um, cleaning up your lifestyle and 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 having all the success that that you've had. So you know, thanks for being here again. <laughs> No, it's a, it's my pleasure, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, and uh, just to finish up, I usually like to ask what what do you enjoy most about uh, coming to uh, conferences and speaking in person? Oh, it's I mean, hundred percent the community. I mean, it, it's without a doubt. It's I I can click a few buttons and reach a few million people on YouTube. So it's not about being able to be in front of an audience. It's about being able to meet people, uh, meet the people that you know I've helped change the lives of, and also. Uh, just have a big echo brain effect, you know, just come in there with a bunch of amazing minds. I always walk out of these things with new ideas and kind of a new lease on life as far as I am professionally and new ideas. So it's definitely, it's definitely the community, hundred percent. Well, I'm sure our audience is going to be excited to to see you there. Um, yeah. So how can the audience find out more about you? Yeah. I mean, uh, YouTube is probably the easiest place. I'm sure most people have seen me floating around on YouTube a time or two. Um, you know, Instagram, a little bit more of sort of my life, kind of my diet, what I do. So, you know, it's, it's all easy. YouTube, just type in Thomas DeLauer, Instagram, type in Thomas DeLauer. Um, yeah. Otherwise, thomasdelauer.com if, you know, there's any need to get in touch with me or anything like that. Great. And if, again, if you want to meet uh, Thomas in person and some of our other great speakers, we have 30, 30 plus uh, people uh, speaking at the conference. Uh, to learn more about it, please visit lowcarbconferences.com. So that's all for now. Until next time, and thanks again, Thomas. You bet.